Jesus says, I am the light of this world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. He'll have the light of life. I am the light of this world. If you follow me, you won't be in darkness. You'll have the light of life. The Lord has commanded, he has commanded the apostles to go and preach the gospel. The so-called great commission we say. 28th chapter of Matthew, verse 19. Go to the ends of the world, preach the gospel, make disciples of all nations, not converts, disciples. Disciple is a follower. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey all I have commanded you. Look at the order of it. Go, preach, make disciples, then baptize them, then teach them. Teaching actually follows becoming a disciple and being baptized. We are called to be disciples. In fact, in the 11th chapter of Acts, verse 26, is written, the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Disciples were called Christians. A Christian is a disciple. Because we are disciples, we are Christians. And therefore, disciple means follower of Jesus. Not just saying he is Lord, Lord. Even devil calls him Lord. The devil also believes in Jesus. He shudders also. We don't shudder. I'm not saying you should shudder in an unhealthy way. You must tremble at God's word. Take it seriously. So we are called to be followers. And when we follow him, we will have difficulties in life. Because now the devil becomes more active. We are a threat to his. He's holding the whole world under his, it is his hand. The whole world under the control of the evil one. The Bible says, last time we looked at it. And when you believe in Jesus, we cross over from death to life. From dominion of darkness to the kingdom of God. And as we go, bearing this message of God's kingdom, the devil doesn't like it. He will trouble us. And when difficulties come, we shouldn't be surprised. It's quite natural. In John 16, 33, Jesus says, I have told you these things that in me you will have peace. In the world you will have troubles. But take heart, I overcome the world. The 13th chapter of John to the 17th chapter of John, John writes about what Jesus taught in the last one week of his physical life on this earth before the cross on Friday. What have we taught the disciples, apostles? What it did, what it taught, are recorded. And there, in 7, 16, chapter 33, he says, I've told you this, what I've taught you all this time. I've told you this, that in me, you'll have peace. What have we teach is, we are supposed to follow. It's not for mental knowledge, for academic knowledge. It's for application. When you apply the scriptures, he says, in the world, you will have troubles. In me, you have peace. In him basically means practically obeying him. Very often you find these two words here. Abide in me. Be in Christ. Abide in Christ. In Christ means what? 1 John chapter 3, verse 24. 1 John 3, 24. Those who obey his commandments live in him and he in them. This is how we know he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. He lives in us through his spirit, always, from the time we accept Christ. We live in him, we abide in him through obedience. Plain, simple obedience. And when we obey him, we'll have difficulties in this world. But because we live in him, we will have peace. We preserve the peace of God. And the word peace in Greek is the word irene. Is, is written E-I-R-E-N-E, E-I-R-E-N-E. Sorry, Irene, it's Irene, pronounced Irene. It means oneness. Oneness. Being one with God. God and man are reconciled by the blood of Jesus. So we are united with him, one with him, and nothing can take away that oneness except our own sin. We disobey God, we disturb that peace. It gets shaken up. But he repent and come back to God, he restores that peace. 
He restores peace. He restores the joy of salvation. When you disobey God, we lose the joy of salvation. We don't lose salvation. Lose the joy of salvation. That's why when David repented of his sin of adultery and arranging a murder, he tells God, Lord, restore to me the joy of salvation. And as long as we walk in the ways of God, we preserve the peace of God and we preserve the joy of the Lord. In John chapter 15, 9, 10, 11, John writes, Jesus says actually, he's quoting from Jesus. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Remain in my love. If you obey my commandments, you'll remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in love. Then he says, I've told you this, that my joy will be in you, and your joy will be complete. My joy will be in you. Who's saying that? Jesus is saying the same joy he had, he's given to us. Even peace. John 14, 27. He told the apostles, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. I don't give as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't be afraid. The peace that people experience in the world is absence of problems. Two countries are at peace when they're not at war. No war means peace. That's a worldly peace. You know, on a personal level, no problem means peace. Everybody has problems, so nobody has peace. But the peace Christ gives is a peace beyond understanding. In spite of difficulties, in spite of suffering, in, time, in spite of persecution, we can have that peace and we can reign in life. We're going to see how we can reign in life today. I'm going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, the blessings of trials. The blessings of trials. When we go to suffering and trials and we endure in a godly way, we are blessed. James chapter 1 verse 12. James writes, Blessed is the man who perceives under trial. When he stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. God has promised those who love him. How do you love God? Obey. If you love him, you'll obey him. John 14, 27, or John 14, 23. John 14, 23, Jesus says, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. So when we obey his teachings, it's an expression of our love for him. And as we love him, we will experience peace and joy. Joy of knowing we're pleasing to God. And he has promised us his peace and his joy. And we preserve that peace and joy by walking in step with this teachings of Jesus. So, what are the blessings? He has promised this uh, crown of life to those who love him, which means those who obey him. I told you to obey him, we face difficulties. And we must understand those difficulties actually are blessings for us. What are the blessings? I'm, I'm going to go through some of the blessings. I may not be able to cover all that I wanted to cover. But enough for us never to complain when you go through difficulties. Rather praise and thank God. The first and foremost is that through trials, we know God more and more. God reveals himself to us through, his through the trials we face. In the fifth chapter of James, verse 10 and 11, James writes, Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You heard of Job's perseverance. You've seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. We take the example of Job. We see what God finally brought about. Normally when Christians study the book of Job, they compare the first chapter with the last chapter, and you ask them, 
What did God finally bring about in Job's life? Oh, he doubled the possessions. He has 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys. Seven sons, three daughters. And finally, we read the last chapter, God gave him 14,000 sheep, 6,000 uh, what is it? Keep cattle, thousand yoke of oxen, thousand donkeys. Everything double. Seven thousand became fourteen thousand. Three thousand became six thousand. Five hundred became one thousand. And he had again seven sons and three daughters. Again, some skeptics ask. Seven thousand became fourteen thousand. Three thousand became six thousand. Five hundred became one thousand. Why can't 7 plus 3 become 14 plus 6? Actually, when he goes to heaven, he'll have 14 plus 6. Not as sons and daughters, but as entities. Always the skeptics who question God. Why he didn't get more sons and daughters? Why can't doubling that also? And cattle came at double, why not human beings? These are skeptics talk about. But what God finally brought was something very different. Far more valuable. When Job went through all those trials... At one point of time, he says, 19th chapter of Job, verse 25, 26, I know that my Redeemer lives. and the end, he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, in my flesh, I will see God. That was the cry of Job's heart when he went through all those trials. And finally, when the Lord spoke to him, first the three friends spoke to him, Sincere friends, but sincerely wrong friends, gave wrong advice. One folk gave right advice. Elihu, youngest, youngest was the most wise actually. Other three were, all of them very concerned about Job. Seven days they were with Job, suffering with him. Seven days he's, you know, in attack to ashes, he's lying down, they're also with him, sharing his pain, and giving wrong advice, three of them. Fourth one, Elihu gave the right advice. But finally when God spoke to Job and asked him questions, so many questions he asked him. Not one question Job could answer. And finally, in the 42nd chapter of Job, verse 5, he says, My ears had heard of you. Now my eyes have seen you. How beautiful, no? They went through all the trials. I know my Redeemer lives. And then you stand upon the earth. After my skin has been destroyed, in my flesh I will see God. It's a cry of Job for God. To know God. Finally, after God spoke to him, asked him so many questions, he realized, I have, sp I have spoken too much. Too much I have spoken. He's, ac he's acknowledging. All of us speak a lot to God. In prayer time, we talk more than listen to God. No? Most of the time, we are talking to him. Give me lectures. The servant tells the master what the master should do. Master is patiently listening. To listen to him, he'll put questions to us. We won't be able to answer. Then we'll say, what an awesome God you are. How can I question you, Lord? And finally, when God spoke to him, Job says, my ears had heard of you, now my eyes have seen you. What God finally brought about Job's life was not just the doubling of his possessions, but a revelation of God to him. Believe me, when you go through trials in life, what you learn of God in those trials is far more valuable than anything else. You will know him more and more. Ezra, in the Bible, who wrote Psalm 119, according to Bible scholars, was a person who loved the word of God. He cried to God for revealing revelation from God's word. In Psalm 119, 18 19, he says to God, Open my eyes and see wonderful things in your law. I am a stranger on this earth. Don't hide your commandments. A cry from his heart. Realize I'm a stranger on this earth. I can't live in this world without your instructions, Lord. Open my eyes that I see wonderful things in your law. And he loved to obey God's word. In verse 167, he says, I keep your statutes because I love them greatly. I love them. I just don't obey them because they are there. I obey them because I love to obey them. And as he obeyed God's word, he faced difficulties. 
he has lot of difficulties he had suffering and then he writes in verse 92 if your law had not been my delight i would have perished in my affliction your law was my delight if it wasn't my delight i would have perished in the suffering ezra says verse 75 in faithfulness o oh lord you have afflicted me in faithfulness because you are faithful to me you have afflicted me what a pers- perspective of suffering and affliction god you have afflicted me because you are faithful to me how could he say that with so much of confidence verse 71 there he says it was good for me to be afflicted that i may learn your decrees because you afflicted i learn more of you your decrees that's far more valuable to me than the affliction your law was my delight so i i don't perish in my affliction otherwise i would have perished but i thank you lord for afflicting me because you're faithful to me he learned so much of god in the affliction after affliction what happened verse 67 it was good for me to be afflicted that i may learn your decrees in affliction i learned more of you nothing greater in life than knowing god more and more at the same time while going through affliction ezra also was comforted he was comforted was 15 some 119 was 15 my comfort in my suffering is this your promise preserves my life in the suffering he learned more of god went through trials rejoiced didn't complain didn't question god's faithfulness but reaffirmed god faithful god's faithfulness and while going through trials he was comforted to the yeah. promises of god while he hungered for god's commandments he also spent time meditating on god's promises was 148 he writes one was 148 my eyes stay open through the watches of the night that i may meditate on your promises meditate focusing meditation means focusing reading bible means we was to us was to us reading you read no all of us read bible as we read some verses god will speak to us we stop and we meditate focus let that word go deep into hearts and minds so in christian life we not to read the bible we hear the word of god being spoken and we are called to meditate on what god speaks to us now for example we have two hours today of teaching or two hours few verses may speak to you not everything everybody get at least one verse if your heart is open heart is closed and think about dinner then is different story altogether but when heart is open something god will speak go back home and meditate focus only on that if there is a commandment how can i keep it if there is a promise how can i hold on to it if there is a standard how can i live up to it as meditation let go deep into hearts and minds when the trial comes the test comes you will reign over the problem you will rejoice in that situation you will be comforted In Matthew chapter five verse four, Jesus says, "Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted." The word "blessed" here is a word called "makarios," means happy. So replace "makarios" uh, "blessed" with "happy." Happy are those who mourn. How can you be happy when you're mourning? Because he comforts you in the mourning situation. maybe there's a bereavement in the family somebody is sick of circumstance point of view of mourning in that mourn he comforts you because he comforts you you are happy you rise above that situation this i'll talk in the next session actually but we talk about blessings of trials number one is we grow in the knowledge of god number two based on first peter chapter 1 6 and 7 the peter writes about how while living in the world we have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials we all face trials in this world 
Verse 7 he explains why these have come. These have come, trials have come, that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine. May result in praise, glory, and honor which Jesus Christ revealed. As we hear the word of God, faith increases. As we apply the word of God, we have problems. You wonder why, Lord, I'm obeying you so sincerely. I'm reading the Bible so well. So much of time I spend. I'm obeying you. Why am I having the troubles? God said, because you know the Bible so well, that's why I'm having trouble. Because through scriptures, faith increases. Faith gets refined through trials. Like gold refined through fire, a faith is refined through trials. And the more you know the scriptures, more likely you're going to face problems because you apply them. And you'll have trials, but in that process, our faith gets refined. Refined. Like gold refined through fire. This Peter wrote in the first century, around AD 61, 1661. Hundreds of years before that, when Job lived, Job went through a lot of trials also. No? But look at how Job responds to the trials. In Job 23rd chapter, verse 10, keep what Peter said in mind, gold refined through fire. Peter said that. No? Around 60 AD. Before that, hundreds of years before that, what does Job say? After going through all the trials, book of Job, 23rd chapter, verse 10. After he's tested me, I'll come forth like gold. After he's tested me, I'll come forth like gold. Refine. So don't look down upon trials. Every trial you go through is actually a refining process. Faith getting refined. And we believers in Christ are supposed to live by faith. We live by faith, not by sight. To live by faith, we need more and more faith. And one way by which faith increases is through trials. So trials are a blessing because through trials, we become more, we, we grow in faith, are better equipped to live for Jesus. The second blessing of trials is increase of faith. Third is, again I take the example of Job. How when Job went through trials, before that itself, uh, he was very pleasing to God. God was so happy with Job, he showed off Job to Satan. Job chapter 1 verse 8. Have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. No one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. God is showing off Job even to Satan. He was so happy with Job. He's the greatest man of the East. It's written in the Bible. Job 1.1, 1, 1, greatest man of the East. According to uh, uh, history and church traditions, he has supposed to lived in Salala. Salala is a town in Oman, it's in the mountains, very fertile place. And that's where he is supposed to have lived. Greatest man of the East. God is very happy with Job. Showed off Job to Satan. And Satan says, oh, why is he so faithful to you? Because you have protected him. He's your favorite. You put a hedge around him. That's why he is so nice. And then God says, okay, you touch him. You, you touch his possessions. But don't kill the man. And one day, he lost all his possessions. What does he do? Job 120. He falls down and worships God. He fell down and worshiped God. Of course, the home minister said, curse God and die. You know, home minister. Curse, him, curse God and die. But he worshipped God. And again, God showed off Job to Satan. Have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He blames an upright. A man who fears God and shuns evil. And God has something else now. He says, he still maintains integrity even though you incited me to harm him Without any reason. Without any reason. So when he went through trials, he fell down and worships God. That's what he is supposed to do. When we do that, 
don't be surprised if god shows you off to satan many years back when i had a trial like this not not like not like job nothing compared to what job went through i had a particular trial and then the evil one came and told me this happened the same day i accepted christ evil one said you know did not believe in jesus your life was fine now you say believe in jesus see what's happened and uh, i told satan before satan spoke to me i got a taught me job chapter 1 verse 8 so i told satan don't come and talk to me you go and listen to what my god is saying about me i will worship him who he is doesn't change who i am in him doesn't change my name is rajkumar rajkumar because my father is raja king of kings lord of lords raja ong ka raja i know who i am go listen to me he will tell you about me don't talk to me you will listen to me of course god won't say that no one like rajkumar that he will not say but when i praise and worship him in difficulties he is so happy he can't help show me off to say look at my son rajkumar he is worshiping me so the third blessing of trials is we are giving god the privilege of showing us off even to satan i learned a simple formula how to handle satan when he talks to you about your past you talk to him about his future tell him you know where you are going you know where i am going let's not talk about the past past is gone future is ahead of us and by the way satan knows more about heaven than you and me when he came from there only. from there he was banished on earth so we are going to place where he came from that's why he's upset with us very angry with us he says we are to him the smell of death we are to devil smell of death i don't think even devil likes the smell of death so he doesn't like us at all he'll do all his stunts ignore him simply ignore him remember god when is happy with us he shows up not only to the world as a display of his splendor also to evil one now when i say this to christians many quest question me what but what are you talking just because god wants to boast about me why should i suffer he is in heaven he is enjoying heaven i am suffering here like a fool why should i suffer because he wants to rejoice over me so come to the fourth point the fourth point is every trouble we go through in this world is creating for us eternal glory in heaven every trial that's why jesus exhorts people who listen to him in the mount sermon in the mount store up treasures in heaven who supposed to store we are supposed to store he only preserves the treasures by our life by our obedience by our faithfulness we store up treasures in heaven he keeps them for us safe so we are supposed to store treasures by living for him when we obey god we face difficulties and those difficulties are creating for us eternal glory in heaven second corinthians fourth chapter 16 17 18 18 paul writes do outward we are wasting away in will be renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are creating for us eternal glory in heaven so we fix our eyes not on what is seen but what is unseen what is seen is temporary what is unseen is eternal so by facing trials in this world because of our obedience to god we are storing treasures in heaven for eternity and paul who went through so many troubles he wrote to the romans roman chapter 8 17 18 if your children then we as as of god and co as with christ if indeed we share in his suffering not that we share his glory then he goes on to say was 18 i consider the present suffering is not worth comparing to the glory that is revealed in us not the ratio of glory to suffering is so high not worth comparing suffering goes nothing compared to glory in heaven 
then we must have those spiritual eyes. Look at things unseen. How does one look at things unseen? Seeing things unseen seems to be contradictory. No? Seeing things unseen. Unseen means you can't see. But you're supposed to see. How are you supposed to see that? First Corinthians, second chapter 9 and 10. There Paul writes, first Corinthians, second chapter 9 and 10. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But he revealed to us, he revealed to us through his spirit. When you have fellowship with the Holy Spirit on a continuous basis, a life of fellowship. Sometimes people ask, you know, how's your prayer life? How is your prayer life? It's not prayer life, it's a life of prayer. Throughout we are in communion with God, with the Spirit. He's an encourager. When you go through trials, he'll remind us of every trial we're going through, creating rewards in heaven. Lord is preparing mansions for us in heaven. Mansions. How they look, I don't know. How many bedrooms there, I don't know. You won't sleep there, I can really assure you that. But the very nice mansions are there. More troubles here, bigger mansions. So when you go through troubles, don't complain. If you complain, then what was happening is mansions, construction stopped. When you're going through troubles, angels, I believe, are preparing mansions for us. Construction going on. Moment he said, no trouble, no trouble. No, I can't handle Lord. Construction stopped. They'll go on strike. Why should I build a mansion for him? He doesn't want troubles. But there are many people I meet today who have complained to God about Job. Job ruled hundreds of years back. They are today's advocates. Today's advocates defending Job. Very bad God is. Poor Job. How much he suffered. How can God do that? That man lived a long time back. He's gone to heaven enjoying. There are so many big mansions there. Here he got a small hut compared to that. And you're complaining about Job. Job's advocates. And by the way, let me tell you, in the English literature, they study the book of Job and Matthew. How many are doing literature? Anyone doing BA English literature? Normally, they study the book of Job and book of Matthew for the English. King James English. They want to learn King James English. We live in the 21st century. Why King James English? Anyway, that's their problem. So they study the book of Job. They get angry. What kind of God is this? Making this man suffer so much? They question God. If ever these people go to heaven, if ever, if ever it's possible to envy in heaven, they'll envy Job. He'll have a huge palace he will have. We'll have a small little cycle. Going in a cycle. Are you complain about Job? No. About God to Job? Advocate. God is just God. You face troubles for him in the world, he'll reward you amazingly. So don't even think about the trouble. Simply focus on following the Lord. So while God is showing off to Satan, rejoice. And I, when, I, when I said that to Satan, I didn't know all these things. What I know now, I didn't know then. God totally taught me these things. Without even knowing all these things, I learned Job 1.8. Within two weeks, I learned that verse. I told Satan, go and listen to him. He'll boast about me to you. He wants to know like Rajkumar. I'll praise him. Go listen to him. And that's all. He stopped. The rest of the devil, he'll flee from me. He flew away. Completely gone. And now and then he comes back visiting. Some visits he makes. Again, he tries the same thing. Again, I resist him. Again, he goes. It's a constant shuttle. Shuttle service going on. Don't bother about him. Ignore that fellow completely. Because he's a defeated entity. Have fellowship with the Lord. So four points I shared. I'll go on. Number one. What is the number one? Who knows? First blessings of trials. Growing knowledge of God. These girls know all that I speak. They've been here in two years. They can give messages instead of me. You know. <laughs> Number two, growing in faith. Faith being refined. Number three, giving God the privilege of showing us off even to Satan. Number four, storing up rewards in heaven. Number five is fruit of the spirit. Now this fruit is actually nine qualities. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. One fruit, not nine fruits. Always share this. Some people read the Bible superficially. 
they will fruit as fruits of the spirit fruits it's not fruits it's fruit one fruit so you find people telling come to my church all the fruits are there he's got joy he's got peace he's got love pastor's got patience or pastor must have patience they don't have the congregation teach them patience but we think of nine fruits is one fruit with nine qualities so god wants in every christian's life all nine qualities to be seen he does it it's the fruit of the spirit not the fruit of the christian fruit of the spirit seen in the christian so god wants people to see that fruit in us out of nine qualities of the fruit three of them faith self control and patience are worked out through difficult people and difficult circumstances difficult people difficult circumstances are god's tools for us to bear at least three of the nine aspects of the fruit so whenever you ask god lord i want the fruit to be seen in my life all nine qualities i want fruit god is okay when you ask him for patience what will he give you troubles why troubles work with patience so you must know what i'm asking someone find you find very difficult to love so lord this man is troubles me very much this person troubling me very much lord uh, give me more love to love this person that man become more difficult to love but god give you love he will give you look to him don't look at the person you are supposed to relate to similarly when you ask god for patience he give you a share of troubles along with the trouble will give the resources he will give us the resources strength wisdom and strength wisdom to know how to respond to difficult people or difficult circumstances and strength to be able to respond out of nine qualities of the fruit three of them patience faith and self control self control means what the greek word is egratia egratia is actually control of the self we can't control ourselves we must let the holy spirit control ourselves that's why it's the fruit of the spirit the word self control implies self control i must control myself self control we think no it's not self control control of the self egratia means let the holy spirit control yourself when the self comes up surfaces you know the, the self is to the ego of man the heart of man very egoistic someone insults us we get upset the ego surfaces ego surfaces put it down who does it holy spirit does it it's like a submarine in the uh, arabian sea or bay of bengal the periscope comes up no periscope you see it what's inside then when the periscope notices somebody with a gun to shoot it goes down so the ego comes up who's the best person to put it down the holy spirit how he gives us wisdom wisdom teaches us humility humility will cut down the ego so it's very important to ask god for the fruit but then you must know what you're asking he'll give you difficult people difficult circumstances for us to learn from that to learn patience and self control that's it number 5 number 6 is to keep us humble trials come to keep us humble there are amazing blessings of trials when you humble ourselves what happens is we are able to receive more and more grace from god proverbs 334 says god opposes the proud gives grace to the humble as you humble ourselves we receive more and more grace and when god blesses us a life changes we learn a lot of things from god we have knowledge and wisdom is possible in our hearts are becoming proud and to keep us humble god may allow a thorn the flesh to come our way to keep us humble this was the thorn the flesh that paul spoke about second corinthians 12 chapter he had thorn the flesh and he asked the lord take it away three times he asked him take it away the lord says my grace is sufficient for you my power is made perfect in weakness my grace is sufficient for you my power is made perfect in weakness when paul understood why this thorn the flesh came 
Upon the flesh, basically, is a messenger of Satan. The same verse explains. Messenger of Satan. Someone who has a message from Satan to Paul. But be a human being who insulted him, troubled him, pulled him down. When everyone praises you, one person pulling you down, you can't take it. Everyone is cursing you. One more cursing voice. Okay, I'm used to it. Everybody's cursing me. Everybody talks again. One more fellow. No problem. I'm used to it. When everyone praises you, one dissenting voice in the corner, don't take it away. I don't want this fellow. That man is very important for you to keep you humble. And Paul understood why this thorn in the flesh came. Verse 7. 2 Corinthians 12, chapter verse 7. To keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing great revelation that gave me a thorn in the flesh. Or a given revelation. God saw in Paul the tendency to become proud. The, the, the trend to become proud. Before he became proud, God allowed a thorn in the flesh to come his way to discourage him, to insult him. In the Old Testament, you'll find terms like thistles, barbs, and thorns were used in the context of people. People, not events. Numbers 33 55. Joshua 23, 23, 13. Judges chapter 2, verse 3. Numbers 33, 55. Joshua 23, 13. Judges 2, 3. Speaks about people in the land of Canaan. There will be thistles, barbs, and thorns in your sights. God warned the Israelites, don't intermarry the people living in the land of Canaan. If you do that, they will become thistles, barbs, and thorns in your sights. So Old Testament time, Difficult people, irritating people, were referred to as thistles and barbs. First century, thorn the flesh. 21st century, pain in the neck. I've heard of people saying, it's a pain in the neck. Good for you, pain in the neck. Pain gets, you know, massage nasal. Thank God for such people. And then Paul understood that. He said, I delight in insults. I delight in insults. He realized he's weak. God saw in Paul the tendency to become proud. Before he became proud, God gave him a vitamin C to prevent, not cold, to prevent pride. pride. Vitamin C take to prevent cold, no? A difficult person comes to us to prevent pride. So thank God for such people. And they teach us patience, self-control, and humility. Because I was in the industry, very often people in the industry come to me for counseling. And a good standard example in the context of knowing that certain people are there to build you up. They appear to pull you down. They actually, God wants to, you to be built up in humility and receive more grace. There was a young man who came to me many years back and said, Brother Raj, please pray for me. There's one very difficult person in my office, colleague, always troubling me. Please pray his transfer from my department. I can't work with him. So I can't say no to prayer. So I pray. No transfer. Come back of two months. Brother, what are you praying? Are you praying? Yes, I am praying. Nothing has happened. Then he said, okay, you change the prayer. If God can't transfer him, let him transfer me. I can't work with him. So I pray for that. Transfer this fellow. Again, no response. He is there. His friend is there. Colleague is there. Both are there. Biting teeth and working together. Gritting the teeth and working. Again, he comes. Are you praying, brother? Yes. Nothing, not answered. Okay, do one thing, change your prayer. Please pray, I have learned to get along with, with him. I have more love, patience to live with him, work with him. This prayer is answered. How? Two more people like him into the department. Basic training over, advanced training. Now. Every difficult person is a tool in God's hand. Do you know that? Everybody very nice to you. How can you learn self-control? How can you learn patience? Don't need patience when everyone's like Pastor Elias. Do you need patience? He's very sweet. Always when I meet him, he's so sweet to me. You know? I'm very sweet actually. Compared to <laughs> I'm diabetic. <laughs> but the point is this. We need difficult people. I have myself difficult people also. Let me tell you that. Don't want to identify their names because I will want to forget them. I pray for them. But then it's important. Otherwise, we'll become proud. And when we humble ourselves, believe me, amazing grace will flow to our lives. 
the seventh blessing of uh, trials is humbling yourself and in that process receiving grace nothing like grace prize a, a, a pride hinders grace how many points are covered seven points six six i got okay seventh point is basically preparation for a future ministry in second corinthians chapter 1 3 4 and 5 paul writes pray to god and father of lord jesus christ the father of compassion and the god of all comforts who comforts us in all our troubles it may comfort others in any trouble with the comfort received from god for just as sufferings of christ flow into our lives so also through christ our comfort overflows suffering flows into our lives comfort overflows so when you go through trials it could be god is training us to counsel somebody in the future go the same trials what are going through now you may wonder why me lord why i am so faithful to you why i am having the trouble will come out of it one day nothing is permanent temporary light and momentary but you come out of it you are in a better position to go and counsel somebody else who has the same problem when you talk from life experience it has impact it's like a a man who's got a drinking problem and he goes to pastor who's never drunk in his life pastor tells him drinking is bad he will say i know better than you you got theoretical knowledge i got practical experience they want solutions i'm not saying to pastor first drink and then go and counsel i'm not saying that just that have compassion on that person on the other hand someone who's come out of a problem for example a wife who had a husband who was alcoholic and she patiently prays for the husband and prays of wife or husband it might always be heard one day she comes out of it i know many couples like that not necessarily alcohol some of the problems they come out of it and she is a better position to go and counsel another wife who going to heroin time is the same god we serve that god brought me out of it brought my husband out of it so you also come out of it your husband come out of it trust in god and we are being trained to be practical counselors it's good to counsel people because very lacking in today's churches biblical counseling when you go to some trial don't complain tell god lord i know lord you're preparing me for something wonderful for the future because i've been a better person to go and counsel somebody has a problem in the family problem whatever in life i've gone through that lord and you come out of it you love the lord and that love for god will show evident the way you speak to people they'll know you've gone through the experience a simple thing like forgiveness we have nothing against anybody forgiven everybody so you speak on forgiveness comes the conviction if you don't forgive and speak on forgiveness it will be a theoretical prestige theoretical lecture when you forgive and then speak on forgiveness people can see through it they'll say i know you are forgiven that's why you're talking so confidently how can i also forgive so sometimes we go through difficult uh, experiences the need to forgive only comes when someone harms you if someone harms you and you forgive that's when you have the joy of forgiveness no one harms you if you hunky dory no experience in life so people harm you and you forgive them remember cause training you for ministry of counseling why should i forgive that man's harm me so much why should i forgive god say i forgive you so you forgive in that process tomorrow you'll find someone else having the same problem and you can say i also had a similar person coming into my life and troubling me i forgave him or forgive her i'm having the joy of forgiveness why can't you also have the joy so never forget that we are all in the process of being trained we are works in progress he is not finished his work in us when he finishes work we'll all go to heaven that time will go right now we are in works of progress works in progress the workmanship of god nothing is by accident everyone who comes into your life has a purpose in it something to learn from them certain things to reject in them not apply that always a learning process so thank god for every experience you go through in life that through that you become a better instrument in god's hands 
and thank god for the blessings of trials every trial has a blessing in it and one more amazing thing is that through trials when you go through and obey god you demonstrate to the world or god demonstrates through us to the world the peace beyond understanding peace beyond understanding peace only depends upon our obedience nothing to do with circumstances so when you have people troubling you and still you obey god people see your peace and they will be amazed at how you can have so much of peace in spite of difficulties that's the peace beyond understanding if you have no problem and you have peace no suffering at all and you have peace everybody understands when you have suffering in the suffering you have peace they can't understand demonstrate that to the world god allows us to go through trials i can never forget the underground church in siberia in 1991 when i went there i was i may still remember after so many years 20 years have gone by and many of them were average age of 55 to 60 years old they didn't have arms or legs arm cut off leg cut off by the communists full of joy no one complained about their troubles went through and i was speaking to them who am i to talk to them they i have not gone to any of the troubles they have gone through with so much of joy they listening to me after two months of ministry and coming back to india the whole church joined together in two months time i became their own and they joined and prayed for me all laid hands on the whole church they called me broad raj broad means brother raj is my name and i they prayed our broad raj is going to india let us send him to india to win all the indians for christ so i am a missionary from siberia to india remember next time introduce me no tell missionary from siberia to india if they are concerned i am their missionary i am an indian i went there too much i am so much of love and you know i am vegetarian basically i eat uh, chicken and uh, not chicken um, prawns and uh, fish please don't take it as hint <laughs> but i had a nice prawn curry in, <laughs> in george's place and i used to eat only uh, vegetarian there they had only pork beef and potatoes that's all in winter siberia pork beef and potatoes i don't eat pork i don't eat beef only potatoes two months i ate potatoes then one day sitting in my room and having hallucinations of sambar rice sambar rice uh, steam coming i'm thinking if only i have rice plain rice enough god will be worship me worship me he show me from psalm 63 verse 5 and 6 that loving can is better than life with singing lips i'll praise you with singing lips i'll praise you my soul be satisfied as the richest of foods god you worship me forget about sambar rice you worship me they close all the doors and windows they shouldn't hear my voice because all the they began to worship god singing all the songs i knew i must soul was satisfied as with the richest of foods it just food for me was actually south indian sapad as they say uta and kanla but god said you worship me i forgot the taste of sambar and rice can you imagine by just worshiping god but those people are so touched by my my response to all these things i never complained they saw that and they felt so bad for me i'm not eating properly so next time i went to uh, siberia they bought apples from the countryside stock my fridge with apples 25 apples they put inside then one day they said, don't buy any apples we'll give you apples following week i had 20 30 apples instead of 25 apples he got angry you bought apples I said no like you one more person gave me apples that's why the 30 apples oh okay 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 didn't buy no very good so loving so much of troubles they went through so much of peace and joy so when you go to trials don't complain never complain philippians second chapter 14 to 16 do everything without complaining or arguing they make them blameless and pure children of god without fault in a crooked and different generation as they shine like stars in the universe as they hold out the word of life don't complain don't question don't grumble against god only praise and worship god in all circumstances you will have victory over every trial reign over every problem in life in that process you make the devil retreat you resist him he'll flee from you praise god amen we'll close now i'll come back at 6 o'clock with the worship short time of worship we'll talk about victory over fear and discouragement god bless you all